This is a weekly summary of interesting news of distributed systems and blockchain. My name is Tomas Bocek, so let's get right into it. This week I found this video here. It's a small home lab. It's the following link here. And uh, let's have a look at this small home lab. I think it's really impressive. And so there we are. This is a little lab. We have a little monitor here that also runs. The look at this cable management. Only. That looks uh, so clean, so awesome. Cabinets. Here he has an air condition uh, uh, here is and uh, he calls uh, it, drives. I have a, a small server, home lab in there. my basement. Well, uh, compared to my home lab, there, this like is an epic that. home lab. Um, these are I'm really impressed, I'm really impressed. Therefore, in lecture three, I talked about economic denial of service, EDOS. So this is uh, if you have in the cloud resources that are paid per use. And uh, if you can find a cheap way to request those resources, you can financially ruin the ones who provide and pays for these cloud resources. And this article uses the term denial of wallet and discusses an example of a potential attack on AWS S3 bandwidth. It's the following article here. And the author discovered that their AWS bill not only contained the actual data transferred, but they were also billed for the data requested, which can include cancelled requests. So they had their bill here, 13,000 US dollar instead of the usual $300 they usually get. And in this article, the author shows that with small requests, he can generate costs that are 50 times higher than the actual bandwidth cost. And the problem, you're not only built for the data transfer, but also for the data that is, is cached internally in AWS in the S3 service. And uh, the author did a test uh, where they downloaded 300 megabyte of data and they were built for more than six gigabyte. They used a large file with HTTP range requests and then aborted. And indeed they had an error in the implementation where they aborted the request, but this could be done by anyone and not necessarily due to a programming error, but it could be due to malicious intent. And they recommend against hosting large file publicly accessible via range requests to mitigate this risk. And another site that is linked here, so the following site here. Um, it is an article that reports on another issue with AWS S3. And here the author saw a hefty bill of 1,300 US dollar for an empty bucket he created. And the question is, what's happened? And I quote, um, this is really interesting. So here what happened. One of the popular open source tools had a default configuration to their backups in S3. And as a placeholder for the bucket name, they used the same name that I use for my bucket. So he chose a bucket name that was used as a placeholder, unfortunately. Now this bucket exists. So this popular open source tool started to upload data or tried to upload um, data to this bucket. So I see two issues. Uh, the first issue is the open source tool wants to store data on an S3 bucket which would result in a huge data leak if the bucket would allow that. And for testing, the author actually did that and collected 10 gigabytes of data in 30 seconds. And uh, the open source tool was notified and they're working on a fix. The author didn't want to disclose the open source tool or the name of the open source tool. Um, so they have a chance to fix that. 
And the second problem is that S3 charges also for unauthorized incoming requests, which could be exploited by anyone that knows the bucket name. And um, there is no need to have actually access to the bucket. You can just ask the bucket, it, get, it gives the access denied, and you're still billed for that. The next article goes into the discussions I had with students about security versus simplicity. And the discussion um, was about development inside or outside a container. And um, it refers to the following article here. So development outside the container is simpler as it requires less setup, but the dependencies you pull in are running on your machine and that has access to whatever your user has access to. And with the XZ backdoor I mentioned last week, uh, this could be quite dangerous. So an alternative is to run everything containerized. That means you need to bring the source code into the container, make sure the right ports are forwarded if you use debugging, and you also need to make sure that hot reloading works. This is doable, but requires additional effort. So the question is what you prefer, simplicity or security? Oh, and while on this topic, check your imported dependencies and libraries and only keep those that you really need. If you, for example, have a library and if you use less than 100 lines of code from this library, my approach is actually to copy the parts I need to my code in order to have less dependencies and make sure you check the license of this project. There are also malicious libraries in the container. So this site also reports about that. For example, they did an analysis on NuGet packages and they showed that there are malicious packages in containers itself. And uh, if you work with these containers, um, you could execute actually this malicious payload as well. But due to the containers, they are separated uh, or they separate your machine from this malicious payload. And the attack surface is smaller because there is no access to data that your users access. It only can access whatever is specified uh, or contained in this container. However, this blog is not about malicious containers. This one here, um, this blog post from JFrog describes how millions of malicious repositories on Docker Hub are being used to spread malware and phishing scams with malicious metadata. And these repositories contain misleading metadata, which can unsuspecting users uh, lead to harmful websites. And uh, these repositories do not even contain container images. It's just about malicious metadata. And they found that around 20% of the public repositories hosted uh, malicious content. And the authors, they notified Docker and the content is now gone. And the content looked like this. So here you have a site for drugs uh, where you have links and you can click on, or you should actually not click on. The last article discusses the significant differences in prison sentences given to Sam Bankman Free, former CEO of FTX and Chang Peng Zhao, former CEO of Binance. It's the following article here. Both are well-known figures in the cryptocurrency industry and Bankman Fried was sentenced to 25 years following a series of serious charges, including wire fraud and misuse of customer funds. While Zhao received only a four month sentence for a regulatory violation related to failing to maintain an efficient anti-money laundering program. And the difference in their legal outcomes is attributed to the nature and severity of the charges against each, with Bankman-Fried's charges being considerably more severe. 
Additionally, Zhao cooperated with authorities pleading guilty and settling, whereas Bank Manfred contested the charges and was found guilty at trial. The article points out that during their legal troubles, Zhang Beng Zhao received a lot of support from people in the community, including letters from industry leaders, which likely helped him get a lighter sentence. On the other hand, Sam Bankman Fried tried to defend himself in court, but wasn't successful, and his defense didn't convince the judge, leading to a much longer prison sentence. The mainstream media also reported about this sentencing, but the headline was a bit different. It was a bit more clickbaity. And the headline was that uh, Zhang Peng Zhao is now the richest person in a U.S. prison. 